All right, welcome everyone to lesson nine of To the Ends of the Earth. This is our study of the last half of the Book of Acts. And it is, uh, we're, we're, we're at a turning point in the lessons or in the, in the action of Acts. So someone tell us where we left off. We're, we're starting in Acts 21 today. So what's been happening? He was in Ephesus and he <clears throat> wanted to speak to all of the people in the in the thing where everyone when they started chanting and then they um they ended up having to leave and he's headed for Jerusalem. Yeah, the riot in Ephesus where everyone rushed into the theater. We have more than 25,000 people, probably because that's how many of the theater seats, and it seems like it was packed with standing room only and they're Channing, so we know there was a big dust up in Ephesus. There was a big uproar. And um, while nobody, Paul wanted to go speak, his friends prevented him. And we think maybe after that, there was legal action against him because he stayed in Ephesus for quite some time. And during that time, um, there was a something, something that went on that made him say to the Corinthians about that period that he had despaired even of life and they, they had found us themselves under a sentence of death and so that um, that must have been somehow a tying tr trying time and then we get that shift where he is going to head towards Jerusalem right what's he going to do in Jerusalem he's going to be killed Oh, sorry. <laughs> He's ready to be, isn't he? He says so. Yeah. What, what's he doing uh, on the way that he is taking to Jerusalem? He's been collecting money for the poor. Yeah, we see. Um, in chapter 20 that he's talking about how uh, he had decided to go to Jerusalem, but first he's going to go through, he's going to go, you know, instead of going straight to Jerusalem, he's going to go the opposite direction and go through Macedonia and Achaia. He's collecting uh, money for uh, poverty relief for Jerusalem. He's got a bigger entourage than usual, right? Because they're carrying the money. They're in a guarded group that he's going to have people to send back to the donors to say your donation did in fact get where we promised you it would get. And so all of that is going on as he decides to go on to Jerusalem. Okay, so um, let's look at Acts 21 and someone read one through three. So first few verses. This is at the close of his goodbye to the elders in Ephesus, right? They've had this speech by Paul, but also they have wept and they've pleaded with him. And so they've had a, a, a touching scene together. And we had parted from them and set sail. We came by a straight course to Kos and the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And having found the ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the, the ship was to unload its cargo. You said through three, right? Yes, sorry, I started talking with that while I was still on mute, but yes, thank you. So we get some travel information here. There's a lot of little uh, interesting bits and pieces. Um, if I keep muting everybody, it's because I'm getting some weird feedback. I don't know, it, it may be my connection. So sorry if you're having to unmute more often than you would like to, um, but please do so you can comment. Uh, so this travel information has some interesting tidbits in it. So we notice um, if you look back chapter, so that was the beginning of chapter 21. If you look back at chapter 20 and verse 14, this is travel information that our narrator Luke is giving us. And 
if uh, we say when he met us at Athos, remember this was Luke is part of the party here and Paul had been supposed to sail and changed his plans because of a plot by the Jews, right? There's always a plot by the Jews, right? And so he had gone overland. That's how he ended up at Troas where he preached all night and the young man Eutychus fell out of the window and Paul raised him from the dead, right? So he's supposed to meet them. So they go by, they, by ship, he goes by land, they meet up and the next day we set sail from there and they go down the coast until they get kind of even with Ephesus. And that's when they call the elders out, right? They don't go into Ephesus. Um, we notice in verse 16, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem if possible by the day of Pentecost. So we get the sense that Paul is avoiding Ephesus, right? Like maybe it's the trouble there that he is not sure that he could escape again. And he doesn't want that delay. He really wants to get to Jerusalem by the festival of Pentecost. So that's kind of his goal. And then turning back to 21, where we are, we look at their route. Um, this is a little interesting. And I have a screen share for you. So here is the map, um, just to be oriented. This is modern day Greece. You can see the edge of Italy over here um, and the Mediterranean Sea. So they start kind of on this coast, right? Paul had preached all night at Troas. They meet up kind of in this region. Here they're, they're calling the elders out from Ephesus. Ephesus, you'll see, is this, just this little pointer right there to this city is Ephesus. And so it's in here that they stop and meet on the beach with the elders of Ephesus. They sail to Cos, which is known for its medical school. So if Luke is in fact a physician, as we think, then um, he was probably rather interested in that. It's, a, it's an island and a city by the same name right here in Cos. Now notice it says they found a ship that would go to that was bound um, for Phoenicia. So normally ships, if you notice, see this is the coastal route and normally ships, especially smaller ships would go this coastal route um, kind of along the southern border of Asia, modern day Turkey. And it was only larger ships that would take this all sea route south of Cyprus. So when he tells us that they were going the, to, straight to Phoenicia and they were going south of Cyprus, we know then that this was probably a larger, more um, open sea vessel. We also think it was larger because later when they talk about the cargo, it takes a week to unload and maybe reload. And so this is probably a big ship. They, they look around, they find a ship that they think can make this overseas passage and make it fast because they want to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So that's kind of the, you know, for the readers at the time who would have known what it meant that a ship was going the, to the south of Crete, you know, you get this travel information that's orienting and it sort of paints the picture for them that we wouldn't necessarily know because, I mean, who cares which if they went north or south of Crete, right? So I thought that was interesting. Um, and they go this uh, sea route and land at Tyre. Um, let's look at verse four. Um, it says, finding the disciples there, we stayed with them for seven days, and through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Okay, what's going on here in Tyre? I always find this interesting that the Spirit is urging Paul to go, and the Spirit is urging the people to tell him to stay. It's like yeah. conflicting, you know, the Spirit, it, it, it seems a little strange to me that yeah. it would be conflicting. It would be like, they would say, you know what is so sad, but yes, go. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I think there, exactly, I agree. Um, because when we look back at Paul's view on the matter, um, again, we're turning back to chapter 20 and look at chapter 22. 
Paul says, and now he's speaking for himself, compelled by the spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. So how does Paul think the Spirit is weighing in here? The Spirit's told him to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, that's how he views it, right? And then we have these 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 Christians, these disciples um, in Tyre. These were probably churches that Paul knew because when he and Barnabas, uh, remember when they first go to Jerusalem for what will become the Jerusalem Council, they go through Phoenicia. This is Phoenicia. You know, the, these geography they, it, points confuse us because sometimes they talk about the region and sometimes they talk about the city and we all don't always know they're the same you know area but they have gone through this area multiple times that's one of the times so Paul probably knew these people uh, he's probably staying with them because of his ties with them and we see that they love each other right because what happens in verse um, five and six here someone read that out actually read just read five all the way through um 14 i can read that thanks when our days there were ended we departed and went on our journey and they all with the wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city and kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. And then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Dolomites and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hand of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not, I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Okay. So this deepens the mystery, right? Because what, uh, what are the events that play into this question in the rest of the section? Well, Agabus comes and, and tells Paul that he what's going to happen in Jerusalem when he gets there. Yeah, so Agabus is from Judea. Um, politically, they're in Caesarea, right? Caesarea is a city where Philip the Evangelist lives. Who, where, how, where, do we, where do we know Philip? Is that is the it? Philip is the Ethiopian eunuch in Philip? Yeah. And he preached in Samaria. So Philip was one of, what were you going to say, Aaron? So Philip was one of the uh, seven selected to help when the church was uh, struggling with uneven distribution of food to the widows. Philip was one of these faithful men that was selected to, to help with that. And then at the modern of Stephen, when everyone was scattered, Philip left Jerusalem through that. Remember, it talks about the disciples being scattered like seeds, right? So that they're preaching as they go. The scattering of the disciples is a sowing of the word. 
And so he goes, he preaches through Samaria, he preaches to the Ethiopian, he continues preaching all the way to Caesarea, and then he settles there. And here we are picking him up again in Caesarea. And what do we know about his family? His four daughters are prophet prophetesses. Yeah, yeah. These four daughters, they are, or, you know, I think in English, I know sometimes it's translated prophetesses, but um, they're prophets, right? They're not like just girl prophets, they're prophets. Like the, the um, force of the word is the same. There are, this is obviously a strongly faithful community, a strongly prophetic community. They have Philip there, they have these um, prophets, and then Agabus comes there. And so, and he's also a prophet. We know Agabus, actually, he was the one that predicted the famine in Jerusalem for which Paul and Barnabas went and took the famine relief money. So Agabus is known as a prophet whose, you know, predictions come true, right? He's, he's, uh, has this um, reputation, right? And so in this prophetic community, this event happens. How does Agabus tell his prophecy? What is it like? It's a dramatic production, kind of yeah, driving it home. Right, right. This is like the prophets of old, right? The Old Testament prophets would do these kinds of things. There's a, a scene where um, Solomon has disobeyed and is going to lose part of the kingdom. Uh, this is like David, Saul, uh, Saul, David, Solomon, you know, so this is like a thousand years before. And the prophet Ahijah comes and he's directed to get a new cloak and to cut it into 12 pieces and to separate the pieces because these pieces are going to be torn out of the hand of Solomon. It's, it's this dramatic enactment with props, right? There's a prophecy uh, where Jeremiah um, is told, go buy a linen belt and notice how nice it is. Ooh, look, my linen belt is so lovely. Now go bury it in the mud. Now come back much later and see how it's ruined. And the people of Judah and Israel have ruined their lives by disobeying God. And they're now going to be, they're, they're in their ruined state. They're going to be taken into captivity. And out, you know, this, like this Jeremiah kind of belt thing, I think, sort of echoes through this belt prophecy that we're getting with Agabus because at the end of this prophecy with Jeremiah he says you guys have ruined your lives and it's going to start showing um, but he says also as a belt this is God speaking um, so me is I is God in the in these this quote um, this is Jeremiah 13 if you want to go read it for as a belt is bound around a man's waist, so I bind the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to me, declares the Lord, to be my people for my renown and praise and honor, but they have not listened. So there's this, like, he's saying, you wrecked it all. Look, you're ruined like this ruined belt. And at the same time, he keeps saying, but you're, uh, I have you, but you are bound to me. You're headed towards this captivity and consequence for your actions, and yet I bind you to me. Um, and here, it, this is part of, you know, in sending Jesus, this is the fulfillment of God's plan for the whole people that he has chosen and using them to reach out. You know, we get like a, sort of this reference to the whole story questions or comments on that I don't, I don't know if that made sense I think this echoes through mm -hmm. that's that's helpful because that is such a weird it's a weird scripture so it's good to hear your in Jeremiah yeah. or in Ag with Agabus they're both Agabus. kind of weird yeah but it, it's one of those that I've read over and been like and we're going to move on to the next thing because I don't know what to do with that metaphor. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we haven't really uh, delved into 
part of the mystery. So I think that's part of what's going on with the belt thing. Like, why is it a dramatic recreation? I think it's in imitations of the prophets of old and this use of the belt is kind of calling back some of these other things. But why is the spirit, like what's going on where Paul says the spirit is urging me to go to Jerusalem and through the spirit, they're urging them not to go. And the spirit says this, the owner of this belt will be bound. Like, is the spirit inconsistent? What is happening here? I'm wondering if this, the spirit's message is clearly, <laughs> this is the last trip. And they, they receive the same message, but they respond to it differently. They hear the spirit saying, this is, this is the path that you're going on. And their interpretation is, you shouldn't do it. And his is, I should be ready for it. Mm. It's like the same, same seed falls on different soil. Erin, mm. what were you going to say? Pretty much that, but not as nicely. <laughs> not as eloquent. I'm sure it was, although that was very nice. It's that I really like the seed <laughs> metaphor there. Very nice. Other thoughts? I think it kind of reflects on Jesus and his path to, to um, sacrifice. I mean, he, he walked into it knowing what was going to happen and went freely. And here Paul is getting, you know, he's being told what's going to happen and he's making the choice freely to go and fulfill God's uh, wishes. Yeah, that's a great point. Let's talk about echoes, right? Just as Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem, but he continues to warn them, the son of man will suffer and be handed over into the hands of men, right? So Paul is like, he's continued, the spirit warns me that I'm going to suffer and I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer. And, the, and, I, and these warnings kind of echo that, don't they? Yeah, and Paul views it as, well, he views it as following in the footsteps of Jesus, right? He sees that echo and he intentionally um, leans into it, I would say. Well, and, and Paul spends a lot of time being about a sacrifice, being about laying down his life for Christ and following that path. And so I'm thinking for Paul, this is a fulfillment of what he has always known was coming when he started on this journey. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for Paul, as for all of us, this is the essence of following Christ. It's joining in the sacrifice so that the path is always towards sacrifice in some way, right? It doesn't... Um, this is a, a dramatic version. Not everybody's life takes on this uh, dramatic a version, but um, suffering is part of the walk. Yeah. You know, this passage also gives you the chance to opt out. You know, some things that some things are just overwhelming, and you know, the spirit urged them to tell him to stay. What if he said yes? Yeah. I don't know that there would have been anything wrong with that. That's what they thought. So. Yeah, I think that there's some space within the Lord's will, right? The Lord's will is not like a kind of a magic, like you have to pick the right door or you're lost. To end of game, you know, you died. Like it's, there's a, there are there is space within the world lord's will to follow god faithfully through a choice of actions there is more than one course in i believe in our lives for most of us and for most of our choices there's more than one course that follows the lord's will sometimes there's not and sometimes that's made really clear to us that there's a right way to go here and that i need to take it you know and as we pray and as we you know, seek wise counsel and discernment. And like, sometimes we're like, no, I've got one choice here and I need to take it. But many times there are good choices that open up but in front of us. And if one isn't obvious, it's not because God is trying to trick us, right? Like there's space within the Lord's will for, 
for our choices and our preference. And we see here that Paul really sees it as finishing the race. He wants to complete the work. He wants to lean into that and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, even this geographical, you know, like literal, the road. <laughs> yeah, great point. So the spirit has made clear to the churches as well what is going on. What might that what effect have, have on the churches? Would it, would it then more be on them? Because Paul's not the front person anymore and he's not the, 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 the headliner, so to speak. It's like more weight on other shoulders. It's a great point. I hadn't really thought of that. But I think it is. They, they will need to step up and they may have yeah. some notice of that. Yeah, that's a great point. What else? I definitely think I would be terrified and questioning if this is really where I wanted to be. Yeah. So for their faith, for the faith of these people, when things go horribly wrong, um, which it will feel like, um, there is a, a, a faith uh, that says Paul knew, he chose. Uh, God is working. Um, this is not God being defeated, but God using bad actions to do his good work. Um, and we're joining him in that. So that they know ahead of time that when these things happen, that this isn't, um, you know, the way crashing and burning. I think there's an element of that too. Other thoughts? Well, let's read chapter 21. Um, someone who doesn't mind a bit of a long reading, read 17 through 26, please. Not that long. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what, nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Thank you. Okay, so Paul and his companions arrive in Jerusalem. They seem to have been taking their time here at the end, right? They've stopped and visited all these um, uh, groups of disciples along the way. So it seems like they're in time for Pentecost. So this is probably festival season. It's probably before the festival and um, they come in. And I think the first question I wanna know is what happened with the collection? You know, Paul refers to it later. We know he brought it and he gave it because he mentions it in his speech, but they don't mention it here. Um, and we just, we don't really know. Some scholars think it must not have been received very well or else we would hear more about it. That's one view. Others think, no, it was fine. This is just wrapped up in the brothers received us warmly, meaning like they received us, they got the collection, they were so thankful, whatever. And Luke doesn't want to highlight this. And so he moves on without going into it. Um, we, don't, we don't know that. 
um, verse 18, they go on and they see James. This would be James, the brother of Jesus. He was the head um, leader in the church at Jerusalem at this point and for kind of this generation, right? He's um, early church history tells us that he was the prominent leader in Jerusalem from probably the time that Peter kind of went into hiding and then through the end of his life. Um, and so what does Paul tell them? Verse 19, he greets them and reports what? Tells them about all the miracles and all the great things God has done through his ministry with the Gentiles. With the Gentiles. Okay. And how did they respond? Two parts to their response. First, starting in verse 20. Well, really verse 20. They glorified God, but then they're like, but, <laughs> but. There's always a but. Right. Right. So like, very happy for the Gentiles. Meanwhile, let me tell you what's going on among the Jews, right? That's like this sort of a two part, uh, and there's a conflict in this, right? They're glad that the work God is doing among the Gentiles, but they say, look, many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them zealous for the law. There's that word zealous again, that's, it keeps coming up, right? Um, Many thousands of Jews. So the non-festival population of Jerusalem probably does not support this many Jewish believers. But this is likely Pentecost, meaning the city would be full of many, many more. The, the population of the city would multiply in festival time. And so many more Jews there. And that's probably the, you know, the figure that they're referring to is reflecting this swollen festival population. And, you know, these, this group, right? These are people who are faithful. That's why they're coming to Jerusalem. And over the years, um, the Jewish people had struggled under their Roman oppressors, right? And they have been tortured and killed and oppressed and kept down. And all through this struggle, they're praying their scriptures. They're longing for rescue from the Messiah. They're trying to obey God as God had told them to, right? The covenant was obey me or you send into exile. And if you get sent into exile, turn back to me, seek me, obey my law and you'll be rescued. And that's where they are. They're like, we've got to be super careful about obedience because we need rescue this is how we turn to god so even though you know in light of jesus as we read back to the scriptures we know like that's not how it's going to happen god's going to send jesus but this is how you know it totally makes sense from their perspective to read the scriptures in this way and even those who believe in jesus they believe that God has sent Jesus and he's the Messiah. They still are folding him in with this idea of obedience to the law as a response to the covenant that will bring back the covenant blessings, right? And so it's the stakes are so high. They're so desperate to try to do that right thing. And so these, these Jews have believed are still zealous for the law, right? And they've been getting reports, right? This, this word uh, 21, they have been informed. This is not like rumors are floating around. This is like they have gotten official reports, right? So someone, and we talked earlier about how there was probably a circumcision party among the Jewish believers that said that uh, obeying the law is still super important. Um, so someone is like, they have an organized program of saying, this is the way it should be, not that way that Paul preaches, okay? So they have been informed um, that Paul is doing what? What do they claim Paul is doing? He's telling people that they don't need to follow the law. Right, Any is Paul telling people that? No. He's saying you're not bound by the law. He's saying oh. the resurrection is more important than the law. But I mean, if you want to circumcise your kids, I'm not going to say no. 
Yeah, and in fact, he circumcises. Um, uh, is that Timothy? I'm just blanking. I'm I think it was Timothy. Timothy yeah. I think so. Uh, so, uh, and now I think we see a little bit, you know, looking back, why Luke included that detail right? Because he's saying, telling them not to circumcise their children. That's one of the accusations of Paul. Well, we don't think Paul is doing that. In fact, he circumcised Timothy so that he could bring him into these Jewish communities, right? So it's kind of all coming together, why we have some of those details from the early ministry of Paul. Um, so what is the strategy that the uh, James and the, the church leaders there want to employ? They want him to go purify himself with four or five others. What are they supposed to be doing exactly? So this was a Jewish rite of um, piety, fairly common, but also fairly costly. So this would be like a Nazarite vow where for a time they would abstain from uh, wine and uh, can't remember what all maybe rich meats and so they would go through a time of purification and then they would go offer these sacrifices but it's like a young ram like it's a significant investment to offer these sacrifices and so these are um sort of not super common but but not unusual right like not everybody would do them but but it these these kinds of purification things would be happening among the Jews. And for Paul to join in with them and to pay their expenses is, is kind of this show of respect and participation with the law, right? So he is going to make a public um, honoring of this practice, you know, in a way that shows that he respects the law. And so that's kind of their strategy. Does that make sense? Questions or comments on that? So is, is James upset with Paul here or is he just saying like, you need to know this is going on and this is what people are saying about you? Well, what, what do y'all think? James is known as a very conservatively Jewish, like staunchly Jewish and conservative. Yeah, he's probably, it seems to me like he's just trying to kind of maybe keep the peace a little bit and, and, and position Paul in a way that it's not going to just be horrible for him with all of these Jews. Yeah, I agree. I think that he respects Paul, but he has the realities of the Jewish community very much in view, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's behind his, notice how he repeats this, as for the Gentile believers, verse 25, we have written them our decision and he goes through those four things again. Like, why does he need to say those four things again? We know, but I think that's what's going on there. He's like, look, the decision remains the same. Mm. We're not altering anything that we've asked of the Gentiles. We're not going back and asking them to take Nazarite vows or be circumcised or do any extra law stuff, but you, are not viewed well in this through these many, many people. And the church is struggling with this. And I think he's been living with this um, party of the circumcision, uh, not uh, how do we incorporate, he's been like boots on the ground there in the heart of the most conservative area of Judaism trying to deal with this. And so I think he's trying to um, be wise and do something that brings those groups together. That's how I view it other thoughts or I don't know that I the, the whole little text about as for the Gentiles I mean what did the Jewish people have any business sending anything to the Gentiles about how to be Christian because they wanted them to be Jewish Christians which is not where they were coming from it's almost like already here they they've already referenced out to you know where Paul has to rebuke Peter for tying them up with the Jewish traditions. Yeah. Well, and so this, you know, you're right that this didn't, this ruling didn't solve it. And there still kept being this push pull um, 
over the course of Paul's letters. And um, eventually the church was primarily Gentile, but here it's still primarily Jewish, or at least it's considered primarily Jewish. So these- Is that a thorough translation there, the letter with our judgment? Um, In 25, but as for the Gentiles, we have sent a letter with our judgment. Decision is another translation of that. Um, it's referring to the council decision. This, these four things that they've said were things that all um, peoples, not just Jews, were to follow in the promised land. So among the promised land, even foreigners among you who aren't circumcised and don't keep the law are to do these things. So the first three things are all about um, food, food fellowship. And so, you know, to ask them to do those things is a way of um, maintaining an ability for them to eat together, to fellowship together. And then the sexual immorality is, of course, like a um, an actual like standard of godliness that Paul and all the apostles, anyone is asking um, believers to live by. Like this is how God wants you to live. He wants you to live as sexually moral people. He wants you to live with a sexual ethic that is different from the sexual ethic of the pagan society that you're in. So kind of two parts to that, right? Like follow these practices of kind of just basic cleanliness that all the foreigners were to do when they were in the promised land and start living by a moral ethic that is godly. But it doesn't fix it. Um, it's not, you know, this, this council decision, I think, is wise, but we see that it's not uh, its not a panacea, right? It doesn't just like, and then everyone was fine together, right? That there continue to be struggles. That's a good point. Other questions or comments on that? Okay, so verse 27. Uh, let's look at this one. When the seven days were nearly over, okay, so we read this, it's like he's about, he's almost made it, right? He's about to show that he's respecting the law. He's about to get to do this like public uh, demonstration of his respect for the law. He doesn't quite get there. He's before that, before he even gets the chance to do it. Some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Okay. Where in Asia has Paul spent a lot of time? Is Ephesus in Asia? It's Ephesus. He, yeah. he didn't spend anywhere on the way back. He was anxious to get to Jerusalem and didn't want to dilly dally. Mm -hmm. He didn't. And he didn't want to get caught up in Ephesus where he'd had so much trouble, right? So I think that this is one of those like city state kind of things where the, um, these Jews from the province of Asia probably knew Paul from Ephesus and from his time in Ephesus. It's where he spent three years. It's where he had such a, a problem. And so that's, that's probably that as probably Ephesus people, right? They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him shouting, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and has defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian. Okay, did they know Trophimus? Did they know he was a Greek because they were from Ephesus and he was from Ephesus? You know, he's probably dressed as a Greek as well. There's a difference in dress. Um, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions and seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. And while they were trying to kill him, news reached, or um, it's actually literally a report went up to the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar and he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. And when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. 
Okay. Um, all right. So Jews from Asia show up and what is their claim? What do they say Paul is doing and teaching? He's teaching against the law and against Jerusalem and against all that is good. Yes, yes, everything holy, right? Um, against our people and our law and this place. What is this place? The temple. Or maybe Jerusalem. I, you, I missed the first part of what you said. Could you say it again? I said the temple, or maybe it's just Jerusalem. I think the temple. Yeah, I think um, because we have to remember, you know, it's so hard for us to conceive of how they viewed the temple, right? What does the temple mean to them? That is the place where they can worship God. Yeah, because why? God's there in the temple. God is there. Yes, that special. Okay, so this is the place where heaven and earth meet, where earth is, uh, you know, heaven is thrown and earth is the footstool. And that comes together in the temple so that it is a special manifestation of the presence of God and the mark of God's chosen people, Israel, that they have there, right? So much is bound up in this place, right? And um, it, to have brought, they also accuse him of breeding in Trophimus, right? Well, um, this would have been a sacrilege that ritually defiled the temple. Archaeologists have recovered um, signs that had been, that were posted in this age uh, on a barrier that surrounded the inner courts, and they were posted in Greek saying, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who has got trespassing will bear personal responsibility for his ensuing death. <laughs> so this was a capital offense and the one, the only capital offense for which the Sanhedrin was legally allowed by the Romans to execute the death sentence. So bringing, some, bringing a Greek into the temple, doing something that defiled the temple in this way would have been an automatic death sentence and one they were allowed to carry out um, under Roman law. Had Paul done that? No indication that he did. No, they assumed, you know, but he, he didn't, and I don't think he would have, right? He was pretty careful to be respectful. He's with the circumcision of Timothy and like he's doing the vow. Like I don't, he wasn't flouting and we don't see when he's there, there's no trophimus for them to like, you know, if there had been, they would have grabbed him for evidence, right? So interesting about this Romans, this report that gets sent up, right? They're there really quickly. Um, the reason is because there is the Tower of Antonia is right at the northwest corner of the temple complex, and it is the place for the commander and the guards. And during festival time, they were always on high alert waiting for a riot. And so it's right there. And there's steps that literally come down to meet the temple steps at the outer court. So the report goes up and they rush down, right? <laughs> They're just right there immediately. Um, they, you notice they drag Paul out and shut the gates. Whatever they're doing, they don't want to uh, risk it overflowing into the temple or ritually defile the temple. You know, they might want to murder Paul and they want to make sure that doesn't affect the temple too. So um, two flights of stairs down the commander comes immediately. And what does he do? Notice verse 33. Who does he arrest? Paul. Right. Not Paul's attackers, but Paul. This would have been common for the period, right? If someone's causing a riot, arrest the person causing the riot, not the people beating him up. Um, it seems backwards to us, but this was, yeah. Comments? Did I hear a comment? Um, notice 33, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. What does that remind us of? The belt. Right, Agabus and the, the prophecy. And so we have this, you know, just, just like we would want to know, like if someone predicts something, well, were they right? You know, mm -hmm. so the ancients wanted to see that, yes, this was indeed um, fulfilled. Um, and so, yeah, Agabus's prophecy. Um, 
here's a funny moment. Let's let's read uh, starting in 37. So he orders Paul. Um, some are shouting one thing. Some are, some are shouting another. It's confusion. Well, it makes sense, right? Because a bunch of people have just rushed in from the city. Something's happening at the temple. The temple is so important. And they rush. They don't all know what's there, what's going on. They don't all know why they're there, right? Um, so we look at 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied, are you the Egyptian? You're the Egyptian, right? Who started a revolt and led 4,000 uh, your version may say uh, assassins or terrorists. This is literally Sicarii, dagger men, knife wielders. Um, it's a word that was used by some militant Jewish nationalists active at this time, the Sicarii. So aren't you, are you, the NIV puts it, aren't you? It's, it's literally, you're that Egyptian, right? You're the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 Sicarii into the desert some time ago. And so Paul gives him his answer, right? He's like, A, I'm a Jew. Um, I'm not defiling the temple, right? I'm supposed to be in here. And I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. I'm not the Egyptian. Um, and uh, sounding educated as he says it, right? Please let me speak to the people. And the commander gives him his, uh, permission. This uh, Egyptian is quite interesting. He was, uh, we know about him from Josephus and some other sources. He uh, mounted an attack on Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And uh, Felix, who, wait, let me just double check that I'm saying this right. Where is he? Yes, Felix ordered an attack on the Egyptian and his followers on the Mount of Olives, and the Egyptian is said to have abandoned the followers to be slaughtered. So what the commander is thinking is like, he showed up again, and it like, people were like, get him. He's the one who abandoned the, you know, all the followers to be slaughtered. And so he's assuming that this, um, which was like three years before, this is probably AD 57 and the Egyptian event uh, occurred in like AD 54. So he's kind of assuming like, oh, you must be that guy who has it coming. Um, so he thinks that Paul's that guy, Paul's not that guy and he makes it clear. Yeah, questions or comments on that little section. It's interesting how Paul begins, right? Having received the commander's permission, he stood on the steps. This would have been the temple steps, uh, right in the shadow of this tower, um, the Roman guard tower, and he motions to the crowd, and there's silence. And he said to them in Aramaic, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. Okay, so Aramaic. This is the language in Jerusalem. It's a, it's a derived from Hebrew, but it was the common language of the time. And the diaspora Jews, the Jews that were scattered in all the cities in the Roman world, these didn't all speak Aramaic. Aramaic marks him out as kind of as a local boy, right? He's he is familiar with Jerusalem and the culture there. And so when the people there hear him speak in Aramaic, um, it gets their attention. Right. And it's brothers and fathers. He's going to speak as one of them. He's speaking with respect. He's speaking as a fellow Jew. Right. And he's going to speak in his defense. And this term defense will be a recurring um, word in the last part of Acts. So watch for it as we continue to read the next chapters, because Paul is answering their charges and he's testifying to his own um conduct and his own story, but he's also testifying to the gospel, right? And so this, it comes up like he's making a defense for himself and he always, he turns it into a defense of the gospel. What are the major points of Paul's speech here? What do you, did, if you read this ahead of time, what did you notice? Or if you didn't, skim quickly. It was almost right out of Acts. I mean, he's on the road to Damascus, the bright light comes, he can't see, he goes to Ananias' house, Ananias takes care of him, and then he goes to Jerusalem. They're like, you got to get out of here. 
because no one's going to believe you. They're going to kill you. And you got sent to the Gentiles. Yeah. Yeah. We get kind of the condensed Paul story straight from him. Yeah. What else? What were you going to say, Paige? I'm one of you, you know, your favorite rabbi was my teacher. I, you know me, you should know me. Yeah, I'm one of you is really strong here, isn't it? It's I was zealous, right? I was you. You're zealous. I was zealous. We're, we, we are, we're zealous. He's devoted to the law. He points out he's a trained by this prominent rabbi, right? He's name dropping, right? They would know the name of Gamaliel. He's a Pharisee. He's the son of Pharisees. He has persecuted the church because he too really cares about the salvation of Israel. And so probably some of those still present in Jerusalem could remember some of these events, the, the giving approval to the stoning of Stephen, like these things he refers to, some of them would remember these, these weren't that long ago. And so he says like, look, I'm right there. I care just as much as you did. And I met Jesus and this is what changed my understanding of what it means to be for the salvation of Israel, right? And then, so it's, I I was zealous, I met Jesus, and then I was commissioned by God, right? Starting with Ananias's words, and notice how he, he positions Ananias. He's a devout, he's an observer of the law. He's highly respected, right? Um, he's commissioned, and, and then he's praying at the temple when he's commissioned further, like this place that they're saying he doesn't care about, he was right here and when God spoke to him. And so I feel like he probably had a good rapport going with them, right? Like, I think they're like devout for the law, praying in the temple. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then what does he say that like flips the switch, everything destroyed? Go, I'll send you far away to the Gentiles. Yeah. Yeah, for them to for, for them to hear that God's the, the pinnacle of God's commissioning is go to the Gentiles is not palatable, right? That is not what they want to hear. And so that flips the switch, everything goes back to the 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 anger they had before and escalated from it, right? They raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live, verse 22. 23, as they're shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. I think that's so hilarious that they're flinging dust into the air, right? Like this is the ancient Jewish out version of tear gas. <laughs> I mean, I figure it's, I mean, the dust there is very fine. It, it, could, it could really hurt your eyes. I think, like, <laughs> I don't know, like, or are they so powerless that this is what they have? Like they're just, their frustration, their anger is just exploding and it has nowhere to go. And so there's, they rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Right? Um, the Roman commander maybe didn't know Aramaic. This was all in Aramaic. Right. So he is so puzzled. Right. Doesn't he like go to quite lengths? Take he takes him around. If you read through the end of chapter 23, like he's taking him around to the Sanhedrin. He's like, what? Somebody tell me what's going on with this guy. I can't figure out what he did. Um, so he really wants to know what is going on with this man that is causing such an uproar. Um, and his first thing he tries, he's like, well, you want to know the truth? The way you get to the truth, you torture a fellow, right? This is the, this is the Roman way. This is standard practice. If you want to know the truth, start flogging. And so what does Paul do right as he's about to be flogged? He plays his Roman card. Yeah, this is a huge turning point in the story, isn't it? This this courtyard where he takes him, where he is about to be stretched out to be flogged, was probably the same courtyard where Jesus was flogged. And so Paul is right on the path. Mm. And we have to wonder what causes him to decide to play this Roman citizenship card, right? What it causes him to bring this up? And I wonder if he isn't prompted by the spirit in this way, because we see 
later that the spirit has a new path set out for him. Um, so what, what is the Roman citizenship information effect on the Romans? They're not, yeah, I, right? Say it again, Bethany. I said, I don't think Romans are supposed to be treated in that way. Like, right. And what'd you say, Erin? I feel like this whole thing is almost like a cartoon. You know, you can say, well, and excuse me, you know, I used to want to vlog a Roman citizen and then they're just like, what, what, what? And it's like such a cartoonish you know a story. Are you a Roman? Uh, yes, yeah, it, it is quite a, um, a device, right? Like in the story, like it changes everything. And suddenly, I mean, even to the point that um, if you read the letter that Commander writes later, uh, 23 verse 27, when he writes the letter, he completely remakes the story to, to like make himself look good in light of Paul's Roman citizenship, right? He's like, I had found out he was a Roman, so I saved him from the mob. Like, that's not what happened. But he re, uh, he, he, he spends it, doesn't he? Because this really matters. This was illegal to bind a Roman citizen without a trial, certainly illegal to flog them. Romans were allowed to be beaten with rods after a trial, but not allowed to be flogged. Um, and certainly none of this without without due process. So you can really see the split in the Roman understanding of who counts and who doesn't, right? Citizens count, other people you can abuse with impunity. Like you, you can just tear them up. It doesn't matter, they don't count, they don't matter. You know, and so you can see the real difference that the Christian message makes to all the people who the Romans think don't matter, right? The people who are not okay. worth due process, the people who can just be torn up at will just because you think they'll tell the truth better. Like, these are the people that the gospel matters to. And so Paul, like, suddenly he's in a different category. Everything is different. Um, God has this new path for him, and we see it starting right here. We get the plot of the Jews. So fascinating that uh, Paul has this nephew, um, uh, verse 17, 23, 17, 16, the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot by the Jews and went to the barracks and told Paul, this is the only mention we have of this boy and we don't hear of him again. I want to know all about him. I want to know what Paul's relationship with his sister was and his family and what the nephew does, but this is all we have of it. And so Paul escapes the plot and we get this um, new statement in 2311. The Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must testify in Rome. And so he has been willing. He has followed in the Lord's footsteps all the way to the point of death. And then God turns it into new plan. The plan is for the gospel to go farther afield, to go into the deeper into the Roman world, into the seat of Roman power, so that Paul, the, the, the word of God, the word of God that says that people matter and that God wants you and that um, you're not worthless and just spotter to be torn up, um, this message is going to continue to go deeper and God's going to use these events to do it. We're going to be in Acts 24 through 26 next week. Um, Paul has a series of trials, quite interesting to read these. So read uh, chapters, uh, those three chapters, and we'll do Felix Festus and Agrippa. And we'll see how Paul keeps find, being found innocent and yet stays in jail. Any last comments or thoughts from the lesson tonight? Thanks y'all for a great discussion. I'm gonna stop the recorder. We can do a prayer time. That was a lot.